and back. Okay, I'm good. All right, so last speaker, and then we close it up. Isn't his smile great? He's got an infectious smile, doesn't he? Yeah, have a round of applause for Milton and the VC team. Some great people. You put on a great show, and I'm very pleased that you thought of me to come up here, and so I hopefully won't disappoint. So, <clears throat> burglar is breaking into a home at night. He goes to grab the hi-fi, and just then he hears a voice. Jesus is watching you. The man stops right in his tracks. He takes his flashlight, turns around, and there in the corner he sees a parrot. He looks at the parrot angrily and he says, was that you talking to me? And the parrot said, yeah, I was just trying to warn you. And he says, what's your name? And the parrot says, Moses. And the burglar says, what kind of a family names their parrot Moses? And the parrot says, the same family that names their 150-pound Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> that aside, let's talk all about growing patients and health consumers with telehealth. And I want to start off by saying that I take a different approach to telehealth than all the speakers you had today, you, you heard today, who were all wonderful. And Ingrid, where are you at, Ingrid? Thank you for not leaving health care, because I can tell you that we're all much better off for having you in it, for sure, and uh, for all the other great speakers. Let's start off by saying that I'm not going to give you scientific studies. Uh, I'm not going to go ahead and talk about all the technology. I know telehealth is growing. I know it's going to continue to grow. <clears throat> However, my area of expertise is in consumerism and in patient growth. I did it for 22 years when I was in practice. I owned a, a physical therapy center. I was a chiropractor in a very conservative town, Richmond, Virginia, and we saw well over 50 patients a day. I did, and let me tell you what. This was not like any center where we had referrals coming into us every day, because you don't know real business until you have to hustle to get your patients. Forget about providing doctor care. That's de facto, really good care. So they'll tell other people. You've got to get them in the door in the first place. And so that's where we're going to start off this conversation here. <clears throat> Just a little bit about me. We're going to talk a lot today about what I think is the biggest opportunity in healthcare today, and that is growth in providers. <clears throat> that's the show. If you've not heard the show yet, I started it in January. It is really more of a side hustle, Red Hot Healthcare. I've interviewed I've done 44 shows, mostly with senior leaders and CEOs of major organizations, uh, Intel, Mayo Clinic, Watson, those sorts of things. Um, I can tell you that uh, coming up will be Karen DeSalvo, if you know Karen, uh, former uh, at ONC. Uh, also, if anybody's familiar with LeapFrog, does anybody know LeapFrog Group? Okay, so I'm interviewing the CEO, uh, Leah Bender. She's coming on the show as well. Uh, Mitch Morris, uh, Executive Vice President Optum, he's coming on on Friday. So it's going to be fun rest of the year. Um, after I ran the clinic for about 22 years, focusing on, on patient care and health consumer to patient engagement, I decided to take a step out of health care. I figured after 22 years I had a pretty good run. I wanted to get into more of just straight business. So I took a break. I sold the practice. I went into a consumer segment that I never thought I would go into. I went into the world of online loans. And if you think there's pressure in healthcare, try talking to people that are living paycheck to paycheck and a $400 bill can make them bankrupt. These are the sort of people we had as customers. And I led strategy in a number of marketing areas for this company, for this market leader, and did that for several years. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons, a lot of lessons about what makes consumers go, what makes people make buying decisions, why do they stay away from things. One thing that I feel very strongly about is no matter how good the science is and how good the technology is, and this is probably my different approach, 
it's important to just know the confirmation bias that we sometimes have. And I had this conversation with Karen DeSalvo just the other day, because we talked about the patient portals in meaningful use and how they were so poorly adopted at first that they had to bring down the numbers. They thought that they were going to be much more widely adopted and used by patients. Sort of the mantra, build it, and they're going to come. And one of the things I told Karen is I said, you know, one of the things I learned is this, is that people go ahead and make decisions for one of two reasons. They're either going to get some significant pleasure from the decision they're going to make, or they're going to avoid a lot of pain. So I said, Karen, tell me, how important were EHR portals 10 years ago to doctors? How important were they five years ago? How about three years ago? And she said, well, not really that important. I said, right. They became really important to doctors and health systems and hospitals when they started having to get paid for it, right, or punished if they didn't meet the standards. That's why it became a big deal. It had to be integrated in. But the confirmation bias they had was once we put it in, patients were going to come. And that's not true. Remember something. No matter how you feel about telehealth or anything that it's involved with healthcare IT, what's important to know is there's two parties to this relationship. And that patient is a party that has to be considered. And if you're not meeting their needs, just because you've created the technology, there's a reason they're not adopting it. There's a reason people may not be flocking to telehealth. And it's important that you know what that is and how to design a program to really hit these people and hit them where it's going to solve their problems. Remember, you're solving problems for people. I mean, you may be doctors, you may be healthcare administrators, you may be vendors, you may be startup entrepreneurs, but you've got to solve real problems for real people, otherwise, they're not going to make those buying decisions, at least not consistently. That's what I'm about, getting them to make those buying decisions. And the way that <clears throat> I look at health care is I like to look at the history of health care and recognize the fact that the whole way the system design is designed from 1965 when we first started Medicare, that's when fee-for-service first started, was when Medicare started. A lot of people don't know that. They don't know the history that before fee-for-service there was insurance, but pretty much just for hospitalization. People paid for doctor care out of their own pocket. And what happened was when you developed fee-for-service, even though it was the government paying the doctors in the beginning and eventually commercial payers came in, what wound up happening was the cost kept going up and up and up. And that's really what's happened. You know what's very interesting is in 1950 till today, the average cost of an industry have gone up eight times. Anybody have any idea how much health care has gone up since 1950? 274 times. Now listen, I'm just getting down to brass tacks here. The fact is health care is unaffordable. Now I'm not trying to make a case to go ahead and say let's cheapen it all out. I'm just trying to say there's a reason that hospitals are getting less patients. There's a reason debt's going through the ceiling with patient, on the patient side. And it's because up until a few years ago, it really wasn't the patient's money. Now it's the patient's money. And so when you're looking at telehealth and you're looking at what's going to happen in the future, the way I see it is, yes, there's a crisis going on here, but there's a tremendous opportunity, especially for providers. I look at this in many ways like the early 90s when health systems first started. I think today, for the right providers, the right hospitals, the right health systems that have an expanse, expansive mindset that say, you know what, we have to go after and start being competitive. Why? Because there's not guaranteed payment necessarily. As we get to value-based care, we're taking on the risk. And guess what? More money than ever is going, coming from the patient, from their wallet. That makes a big difference. Because I don't know if you all know this stat, but 70%, 70. 70 70% of all Americans have less than $1,000 in their bank account. Now, for many of us, that may just not simply be something we've ever considered. It's important to consider it. You've got people that are paying sometimes with very little in their savings. And so I like where we're going in health care, but I really like the fact, too, at the end of the day, that those health systems that know how to reach out and know how to solve patient problems and even talk about fees, don't run away from them. Don't avoid them. 
Start talking about them ahead of time with the patient, even on the telehealth visit. Even before the telehealth visit, even before you engage in that telehealth visit, you can check the patient's eligibility. I'm talking about getting into a consumeristic mindset where we recognize that instead of assuming the patients are going to come to us, we start going after the patients. We essentially say, you know what, as a hospital health system, we're going to have people coming to us and we have to keep our costs down. But in the same light, we have to start thinking more like the retail sector thinks. We have to start using smart marketing, not just branding. We have the number three heart hospital in the country. We have Da Vinci Robotic Surgery. That's great branding, but at the end of the day, if you're not Cleveland or Mayo or Johns Hopkins, and you want to grow, and you want to hedge against what's going on in value-based care, you better do it with volume. And not just any volume, smart volume. Being able to tap these people through tactics like telehealth where you can start reaching them in the beginning and get them into your system, get them into your care, even get them away from care they don't like. How about that? How about actually fighting for patients? How about actually competing to say, you know what? We're going to go out in the market and we're going to find those patients that aren't happy with their doctor and aren't happy with their, their health care system and we're going to win them. We're going to win their loyalty to us, and then we're going to grow. We're going to use telehealth to essentially start growing our remote footprint, and then as we do that and we start getting more volume in those remote areas, we're going to fill in. We're going to fill in with physical locations through smart partnering and with mergers and acquisitions. The difference here is you're starting to blend in telehealth, in my view, with marketing. It's not just a cost-effective substitute for a doctor visit and a great way certainly to coordinate care. It can be used as part of the overall package to help health systems grow in the future. So one of the things I want to talk about <clears throat> moving forward here, and this is my point here, to point the second point down. I've had, I've had 40 guests on my show. I've done four shows myself on uh, Red Hot Health Care. Of all the guests I've had on the show, I think I've asked them all the same question. I'm going to ask you the same question. And I want you to think about it before you answer it to yourself. Why is it that everybody in healthcare talks about lowering costs, but nobody ever says, and when we lower costs, we're going to make the pricing lower too, so we can attract more patients to come in? How come you never hear about pricing in healthcare? Pricing to the patient, right? Not pricing to the payer. Pricing to the patient. See, I'm talking about consumerism, gang. That's the difference. Healthcare wasn't designed to be consumeristic or have free market forces. That's why prices are up. That's why costs are up. That's why quality's down. That's what you get in a price regulated environment. If we started in the beginning with healthcare and we had budgets and we had cost controlled, we wouldn't be in this position. So the fact of the matter is, Although this technology is coming out, we have to bring down costs. Ultimately, the way I see it is we've also got to start looking at pricing. Very important. And yes, we've got to make care more efficient. We've got to start, like you said, dropping down costs. But I think at the same time, we can't run away from the obvious. And that's where I come from. <clears throat> so when I look at the future, future success of providers, in part using telehealth, um, I think they have to get competitive. I think it's very important for providers, even smaller providers, to start saying we're hungry. We're hungry to start filling our bucket. Now that bucket may have some holes in it. You can call those holes high costs, poor coordination of care, uh, you can call them never events that we have, uh, whatever you want to call, <coughs> excuse me, whatever you want to call them. Uh, physician burnout, that's a real popular one. Plug those holes up, but while you're doing that, guys, fill that damn bucket up. Fill it up with patients. Fill it up with patients who are motivated to be with you, to get the care they need, to be a part of the experience that your provider, that you as a provider, are giving to them. Don't let it just be about the brand. Let it be about what you're actually talking to them about. Show them. Bring them in with compassion. <clears throat> so be competitive. The second thing is triple aim efforts. Why don't we just call it quadruple aim if you want to throw in culture and uh, physician burnout and engagement, managing health populations. Um, and then the big point I'm making here is marketing. 
going into a health system, into a doctor's office and saying, you never had to do this before. But guess what? Right now, when you're going to have reimbursements declining, because look, I don't care how it all shakes out, reimbursements are going down. If anybody thinks reimbursements aren't going to go down long term, you're living, in my opinion, not in the real world. I don't care if it's Trump or Obamacare or a blend or whatever. We're never going to have it the way we used to have it. So we got to count on reimbursements going down. You got to make up for it in volume. And if you're smart about it, you'll bring in the right sort of volume. Not just patients coming in and you engage them, but you actually go through and you segment them. You target them. You know who you want to bring in and maybe certain people you don't want to bring in. You know, one of my friends is Peter Yesowich. I don't know if anybody knows Peter. Peter's the chief growth officer at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. And I'll tell you something, they've been a brand leader. They've been a consumer leader in healthcare for 30 years. And you know what they do? They spend money on marketing and segmenting and positioning and targeting. They do this, and they are selective on the patients they take. Now, I understand we're going to get Medicare. I understand we're going to get Medicaid. I understand not all providers and health systems and hospitals have that luxury. But I really think that moving forward and looking at consumerism and looking at first dollars, you need to be thinking, how can we get a stronger mix of better possible or better potential revenue into our, our practice? Let's not forget, value-based care is about 20% now. Fee-for-service is 80%. So look, I was down at Hims earlier this year. I talked with several chief marketing officers at several very large health systems, and they'll talk about value-based care until they're blue in the face on stage. When they get off stage, they're saying, man, we got to maximize fee-for-service. Well, I think it's fine to maximize fee-for-service, but I also think, too, you know, because you're in a for-profit business, but I also think, too, whatever you're going to do needs to be long-term, and a growth strategy will work either in fee-for-service or value-based care. So long as you're smart about mitigating the patients that are coming in and making sure on the front end you're getting information about them. That's very important. <clears throat> Improving operations. If you all haven't yet been on our show, go on a few episodes ago. I interviewed a guy that I think is a mind blower. I'll get his name right. Mohan Jiriharadas from Lintas. Guy's brilliant. Uh, he is very strong in scheduling. And in particular, he thinks today's model of scheduling patients are, is, let me see if I can quote him, built on a foundation of jello. That's what he says. He combines lean with AI, and he also combines that with a SaaS platform. And guess what? The guy's got 15 employees. He's in more than half of the top cancer centers around the United States now, and he's moving into pharmacies and labs. The guy's expanding like crazy. Listen to the show. You'll appreciate it. It all centers around focusing on the concept of time in a service business, that time itself can be a great it can cover up a lot of things that are going on. <clears throat> Being bold on growing locally. I think the very first step here is to recognize that when you're starting this process of using your telehealth, start looking at blending it into your overall operations and applying it locally. And I'm not just talking about your current patient base that hasn't been in in over two years or your patients that are there now but they're not activated. I'm talking about going after and finding people in your local geography that are searching under Google. And guess what? They search, a keyword pops up, and you need to be on that paid ad space. They click, they need to be going right into a damn telehealth conference right then and there if that's what they want. Get them. Strike when the iron's hot. That's why people are searching. Don't wait for them to pick up the phone and call the call center. Get them to you know, connect with you quickly. Start closing that gap. <clears throat> Less dependency on payers. I don't like payers. I think they serve a purpose. I think they're necessary. But I think largely they have stymied free market forces. And unfortunately, they have continued to pass costs on to individual and business consumers. They're there. They have their place. And we, and we do need them. But I think that the more that providers can get away from payers, the, uh, I forget who it was, Karen talked before. Are you here, Karen? Did Karen leave or is she still here? Well, Karen talked, I think, at noontime about this. Learning how to go out and not just getting patients directly, 
go after those direct contracting opportunities with those self-insured uh, payers in town. A lot of them are hungry for that. A lot of them would love the idea of a big health system or a hospital chain coming to them and saying, hey, guess what? We can go ahead and set up a fee schedule for you and your employees. We can bypass the insurer and we'll work with you on your claims process. Walmart's doing it now. There are companies starting to do that right now because they recognize if they can contract with health systems and health systems can bend a little bit and be flexible, there's a padding area of monies that are paid on, that, uh, on the claims management side that can be eliminated. We're talking about health care dollars here. Finally, <clears throat> lower pricing. I think there will be a day eventually as more patient volume is accumulated in health systems and with providers, I think there'll be a day where you're going to see not just transparency, but the ability for health systems, especially with self-insureds, to go in and say, hey, we can make our price lower than what they're doing. When we bring down our costs, we bring up our efficiency, we streamline our operations, and we have, better, and we have more volume coming in. <clears throat> We talked about it before. I think that health systems hospitals have a great opportunity right now. I even think they can, they can grow across states. Donald Trump talks about growing coverage across states. I don't look at it that way. I look at growing actual patient pools across states, starting with telehealth when it's legally allowed, when the laws open up for that. You start within your own state, and then as applicable, you go into different states. I see a day where you see UCLA Health System not just serving Los Angeles and all of California competitively, but serving certain populations in Alabama, Michigan, New Jersey, Delaware, targeted populations that they go in and say, we want that population. We've looked at it. We know we can take on that population, and we've looked at the way that as we're growing here, it's going to add in long-term revenue for us, and we can take on that risk. Smart marketing, smart targeting. <clears throat> and we talk about once you acquire patient loyalty, once they come in, they're yours, they're loyal, now you can start it controlling the experience. And I don't mean controlling in a bad way. I mean controlling as in holding their hand and say, now we have your loyalty, now you know that we're empathetic, now you know that we follow through on what we're doing, Let's go ahead and take you through the rest of the journey here and help you get there. Remember, the patient always has the opportunity at any time to step away and say, I'm not buying what you're selling. And that's another thing, now that I think about it. When we talk about things like call centers, when people get called for their health care management, I like the idea, if it's not done in every single one now, and I'm sure we've talked about it anyway, but I like the idea of having every call center rep looking at that patient face-to-face -face on that screen and being trained. Trained how to engage that patient. Trained to look at that patient's eyes and see when they're paying attention or see when they're diverting their eyes. Knowing how to talk with a patient, communicate with them, not only empathetically, but what are the triggers that the patient's giving them. It's much harder for a patient to disengage from a conversation when they're looking you straight in the face than when they're on the, the telephone. Big difference. So I'm a big believer in that as well. <clears throat> Again, I don't think it's just a more convenient form of a face-to-face -face visit. I see telehealth as a tremendous opportunity to be blended with marketing, a new type of marketing, not just advert like image marketing, not just, you know, we're the best in America third year in a row. Marketing that is personalized and targeted like they do in retail. <clears throat> when I look at telehealth here, who are we talking about engaging? Your inactive patients, inactive patients of other providers, active but unhappy patients of other providers, pre-chronic and chronic individuals. What do I mean by pre-chronic? Pre-diabetic. Find people who basically haven't had a physical in five years. Get them in to have a physical. You know, one of the most important things I think that we've lost, one of the, most, the biggest key messages we've lost, and as a chiropractor, I had these conversations every day with patients. I'd have patients coming into my office, so help me God, this is the truth. They would come in at 33 years old into my practice, and they say, Doc, I started having neck pain, a little tingling down my arm. It's like right in the right pinky here. And I'd say, okay, well, let's examine you. And we'd examine them, and I'd say, oh, let's take a couple x-rays. Well, I'd take an x-ray of them, and guess what? they'd have the neck of a 70-year-old. But they only started having pain a few weeks ago. 
Well, how can that be? Well, that can be because essentially how you feel is no indication of how you are. And when we start getting into population health management and in telehealth, it's not just addressing the patient's symptoms. It's talking to them about that reality, that guess what? Even though you feel fine, it's important to get that yearly physical. And you know what? If, you don't, if you're 40 years old, go in and get that check for diabetes. Why? Well, because you're 20 pounds overweight. Yeah, but I'm not diabetic. That's okay. Get in anyway. Let me tell you why. You don't want to wait because sometimes it's irreversible. And you're not scaring the patient. You're just telling them the truth. The body doesn't heal from everything all the time. If it did, I could chop your arm off and it would grow back with the right vitamins. I don't think so. <clears throat> okay. And we're going after employees. Why? Because, look, there's only one sliver of a layer between most self-insured companies and, and, and providers, and that's the insurance company, the payer, that's managing the claims. And does anybody know Dave Chase here? Does that name ring a bell, Dave Chase? Yeah? Okay. If you don't, please take this down. Uh, I think it's called Health Rosetta. Dave is a powerhouse guy. I had him on the show. He's coming out with a movie on what's going on in healthcare and healthcare today, what needs to be changed. He just came out with a brand new book on Amazon. It's a stellar book. Dave Chase, good guy, good friend of mine as well. Uh, okay, <clears throat> skip that. Uh, is Merritt here? Where's Merritt? Did Merritt leave? Hey, Merritt. So you talked about a little bit at lunch today. We were talking about telehealth, and I think you said something along the lines of, you know, if you think about it, telehealth is really just I mean, you're just looking at the patient through the screen. It's a personalized communication. And, you know, you're exactly right. It's personalized communication. And I really think that we've had so much negative technology with EHR for every two hours of the patient. What is it, like there's three hours on the EHR? I talked with John Glazer. Anybody know John here from Cerner, right? I talked with John Glazer, and John said there's so much pajama time right now. Does anybody know that term, pajama time? That's the time that physicians have when they get home after they eat dinner and they have to go back on the EHR at night to fill out the rest of their daily notes. That's called pajama time today, all right? That's what's going on. This is a technology where you can start connecting with people and connect in a very personal way. Um, latest study from Wisconsin. Who's read the latest study on telehealth from Wisconsin, the five-year study? It's like 140,000 patients. It shows that even though more people use telehealth, um, there were more office visits, physical office visits. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day what that shows me is we just need to streamline the scheduling and the visits. Healthcare is extremely complex. Healthcare is extremely inefficient. Um, and I think this will get a lot more efficient when it starts getting uh, more into the flow and you start applying lean to the process as well. Um, start developing solid telehealth within your own community to acquire smart volume. Use it for reverse medical tourism. What do I mean by that? I mean, and I consulted with a company on this. I'm on their board on Medville. <clears throat> it's not about just having global consults. Guess what, guys? People have money around the world. Not everybody's poor. There's lots of people in India and lots of people in China that are well off financially and in, and in Europe, too. And guess what? As reimbursement goes down, you know what places like Johns Hopkins and Cleveland and Mayo Clinic, which, by the way, are the top three facilities in the country that do reverse medical tourism, they're not just engaging patients on a consult. They're setting up the whole tourism to come in and get the services. Why? Because it's all cash. It's all cash. These people pay cash. It's not dirty to be paid for for good service. I'm just saying the bottom line is when you're looking at your mix of money, start thinking that telehealth is a tip of the spear. It's not the beginning and the end. Find ways to bring these people in and get them the care that they're seeking. You know, like Alec Baldwin said in the movie Glengarry Glen Ross, you know, he's not walking on the lot lest he wants to buy. They're not connecting with you from China or India just to have a con casual conversation. They got a real problem. Solve it, and if you can and they need it, Solve it all the way. Develop programs that build themselves around telehealth more than the consult. All right? Um, and I know I'm running out of time here. Free consults. Please, please, please. If nothing else, don't get lulled into the fact that if you give something away for free, even if it's an initial 15-minute consult with the doctor, whatever, it doesn't cheapen it. 
Remember, a lot of these people are unsure about jumping in. Maybe that's why they're not jumping in right away. Give them a reason to feel good about coming in. Give them a reason to feel good about engaging on a first telehealth consult. Yeah, you lose 70 bucks or 50 bucks, sure. But what could you get if that patient, that brand new patient to your system does come into your system? I look at it as an investment. And yeah, you've got to look at the ROI, of course, and measure it. But guys, I mean, we're in the business of saving lives. We're in the business of connecting with people. We're touching lives here. We've got the ability to really change human life. And if they're hungry for it, why not satisfy it? <clears throat> and in conclusion, we'll just move on through here. Um, I do want to go ahead and just say one thing, if I could. Uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> just this point above. Proactively versus reactively. I want to really sort of end on this. We've been in a system that in many ways has been for 50 years a system where risk has largely been taken out of the equation for payment. Payment, uh, you know, not all claims are paid, but for the most part, when you check eligibility and you know what the benefits are, a lot of the risk is taken away. That's changing. That's changing rapidly. It's going to continue to change. I see it getting worse and worse. That's French for I see more responsibility going on the patient, even more than today. And I think at the end of the day, you've got to go out and get these people. Don't wait for them to come to you. Don't wait for them to line up at the door. I mean, take care of them lining up at the door, but be hungry to get those patients proactively. That's very, very important. And don't just assume that because you built something and they're not coming that they're wrong. Maybe you're not right for them yet, or maybe you haven't made it right for them yet. Remember, there's two parties in this relationship, all right? <clears throat> the last thing I want to mention is pink socks. Nate threw out some pink socks today to you all. Does anybody know what pink socks is? Show of hands. Yes? High up. Don't be bashful. Okay. So guess what? I'm part of the pink socks tribe. All right? My last podcast was with uh, Nick Atkins, who founded Pink Socks, and I will tell you on your next ride home or your walk tomorrow morning or whatever, listen to it. It's amazing. The guy's amazing. Essentially, Pink Socks is not about healthcare IT, it's not about saving healthcare. What it's really about is getting together, having some sort of a bonding under the notion that you're changing the world. You're changing the world. You're wearing the pink socks because what it says is, and when people ask you, is you know why I wear these pink socks? Because I got them at a telehealth seminar, and at the end of the day, I got them because the guy on stage, that crazy guy on stage said, there's something about wearing pink socks that tells people, and that makes me feel like I'm part of something bigger than myself, that I'm giving back to the world, that I believe in something bigger, and that I'm with a group of people that feel that way. And so guess what? I have two dozen pairs of pink socks, and they're in that bag. And when I'm done, or when Milton's done, whoever wants them, I want you to come up to me, and I want you to get them, and I want to give it to you. And I definitely uh, look forward to that. And just a couple ending questions here. These are rhetorical. How do you plan to use telehealth in a way other than a billable service? And are you waiting on payers to determine how you're going to grow with telehealth? Those are two important questions to ask yourselves. OK. All good. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The hands are up. I would love to hear your uh, observations or thoughts about why employer uh, offered telehealth is so low. All the statistics show that utilization is only two, three percent. Although yeah. last year, more than ninety percent of employees, uh, employers, sorry, offered telehealth. Yeah, I think the same reason. Uh, well. I think one of the things that happens is there's a disconnect because what happens is it's the same way there's a disconnect a lot of times with healthcare technology. Um, you build it, you put it out there, and like the doctors expect the patients to just follow. I think that's sort of the way in that relationship. The bridge isn't connecting, and the bridge isn't connecting either because the company that's bringing the telehealth service to the employer is not following through and say, hey, listen. 
Now we want to develop a program where once a month we're going to connect with your folks and we want to find out how much they're using and if they're not, we want to find out why. Secondarily, you have to impress them not just of the fact that you're going to have a telehealth service and there's value in it, but the second half of that is you have to give them the tools for them to educate their people. That's very important. Just because you tell them about that and say you need to tell your people all about this and why it's so beneficial, here's a sheet. It's so interesting. I, and I just, it, it's just hitting, hitting me right now, Ingrid. I can remember somebody telling me one time at a motivational seminar, I don't know what it was, Tony Robbins or something, and they said, when you ask somebody if they know something, and did they understand you? And people say, uh-huh, I understood you. And if you say, okay, well then, just to humor me, could you just explain it back to me so I, explain it to me so I know, you know, that you've got it completely. That's one of the things we don't do. We sort of tell them and then just assume they get it. And then when they say, the HR person says, yeah, 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 or the benefits person says, yeah, I got it, thank you so much. And then they got a thousand other things to do. You think they got it and they think they got it. And that's where the bridge is. It's keeping a constant connectivity and grid after that handoff. After the deal's made, that's not the end of the deal. There needs to be a continual relationship there and ways to make sure that they're communicating the benefits, the value to their people. Not just we have a service. Not just, hey, we have telehealth now. Hey, we've got mental health, telehealth that's covered by the company. You know, yay, and everybody forgets about it. You know, what are they doing to remind people about that? What are they doing to sit down with people on the workplace evaluations and say, hey, Jim, you know what? I know you've been feeling some stress lately. Um, you know, I'm certainly not a doctor, but I'll tell you what, we've got telehealth service here and we pay for it. Why not use it? Um, you know, that sort of thing. Some people would think it's going over the line. I think it's engagement. I think people want to be cared about. I do. So that's how I would answer that. That's a very long answer to your short question, and I appreciate you being patient for it. Uh, I'll, yes? You talked about payment systems and um, the insurance, the role of the insurance company. What about borrowing the model from the credit card industry where uh, the hospital runs the insurance program, just like Geisinger and others, and then a card from a hospital in California works in Maine? Yeah. I don't see anything wrong with that. You mean talking about integrated care? Absolutely. Look, you know, the interesting thing is, is, is that <clears throat> the interesting thing to me is I think that a lot of people believe that the payers and the providers have equal leverage moving forward. I don't see it that way. I think the providers have much more leverage, particularly the larger health systems. And I think if they can start, if they can find ways to integrate, look, they're going to have to take on risk anyway whether they like it or not. So if they start integrating their care with coverage and they start doing direct contracting, really I think that if you can get the relationship more direct, and that's changing. I mean, that, there's over, I think there's over 100 health systems now that offer integrated care as well, something like that. I mean, it is changing. Um, yeah, I'm all for that. I'm all for anything that takes layers off that don't need to be there. And so I get that insurance needs to be there in many cases. I don't think it needs to be there in every case. And I would say this, and I'm on record as saying this, I think a lot of insurance companies that manage claims for self-insured companies mm, have things built in which are less than savory that those companies don't know that are going on. And I'll just refer you to Dave Chase's work for that. But there's a lot of things going on where there's extra payments being generated that are not in the interest of the self-insured companies. I think I'm all for that. Yes. Yes. Oh. Thank you for. Oh, your... I just sat next to you before. You yes. Did, you and did. you're going to get your pink socks, by the way. I I'm looking forward to them. <laughs> I can't wait. Good. I'm going to wear them on my walk tomorrow. Good. All right. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Um, I am. I underscore a lot of what you have said, and I think physician adoption is actually very important with respect to uh, patient adoption and marketing. So the corporation where I work, so I'm a medical director for a self-insured Fortune 100 Financial Services Corporation in North Carolina. We've had 
about over 4,000 employees. We had about 1,000 employees relocate to another site in Charlotte, and we used telemedicine using VC as a clinical blended model for yes. this site. So we were leveraging mid-level providers two days a week, and we're providing a telemedicine solution on those other days. So I think ph physician adoption is very important, and we've been very proactive in marketing, um, and uh, the results are very promising. So yes. I thank you for your presentation. Yes, and thank you for that too. I appreciate that. I'm a big believer in this brave new consumer world that you're preaching. <laughs> um, but healthcare is one of the only industries I know of where the consumer walks into a store, for instance, and all these wonderful things you can buy, but there are no prices. That's, yes, and there's no right. quality rating. Yes. And you're blind to the actual cost, even if it's coming out of your pocket. Yeah. So you can imagine going up to a desk and asking the price for an MRI, for instance. Yeah. You won't even get an answer. So the, the question is, uh, your opinion as to what would be the catalyst that breaks that mold. I know there are organizations like the Healthcare Cost Institute in Washington, which publishes state by state yeah. comparisons of different procedures. Mm -hmm. And if I were to need a lot of procedures, I know where I would go for, to Arizona for certain things, to Massachusetts for another one. I mean, the, the, the range of price differential across the country is staggering. Yeah. And that's just from claims. But if you actually be, uh, developed a consumer model where you're actually maybe showing prices or publishing prices, then you, right. you'd really change behavior. Yeah, I think so. You know, um, what's very interesting is, you know, I keep referring back to my show, so if you people don't listen, I'm really going to be mad. Uh, my very first episode on, in January this year was with a guy named David Goldhill. I don't know if you know David. David is the uh, CEO, or was, he just left after many years, of the Game Show Network. He wrote a book called Catastrophic Care, which if you've never read a, a great book on health care, that's a great book on health care. Uh, uh, one of the better books I've ever read. And David doesn't have a healthcare background, but his father was injured and died as a result of medical malpractice. Instead of suing the hospital, he decided that he was gonna go in and say, what allowed this to happen? What caused this to happen? And when he did, it was a mind blower for him. He looked at the industry and he said, holy hell, this industry is not even consumeristic. In fact, the customers aren't even the patients. The customers are the payers. And he's like, this is totally backwards. I really think that, and, and, and his, I don't think there's an easy fix because at this bottom line that you see right up, <clears throat> well you don't see it on your screen here anymore, but I really think I had this conversation with Joe Antos of um, American Enterprise Institute, Joe's an e economist. Um, you know, I just said at the bottom of it all, Joe, I think what's really happening is <clears throat> we have the business of healthcare matching up against now the true needs of the healthcare system. And they don't really line up. And they especially don't line up when you don't have a consumeristic system, because guess what happens? As David Goldhill talks about in his book, when you don't have consumerism and free market forces in play, what happens? Costs go up, which we just talked about healthcare costs going up 274 times. And of course, as costs go up, what else goes up? Pricing, right? And quality goes down, because there's never been a need to pay attention to quality because under fee for service you got paid pretty much either way unless you hurt the patient in which case then there'd be an attorney involved so all that being said what you're really thinking about here and what I'm thinking about is how to work consumer forces back into the system if I had to say off the top of my head how I would do it or would want to do it <clears throat> first of all I don't think it's an easy change I think health I think there's going to be a shakeup no matter what you do because I think that there has to be a lot of digestion going on. Healthcare has got the most employment of any sector right now, which means if you start changing things in a meaningful way, there's gonna be a shakeup and business, some businesses are gonna close and people are gonna lose their jobs. And some of that may just have to be stomached because we're, we're overheating, that's the fact. We, we're just overheating, we can't sustain it. I think if I had to do it, I would probably go along the lines of what Gold Hill said, which he said, have catastrophic care coverage for everybody. You know, I don't know, put a dollar amount on it after $10,000, anything there and above would be covered under a national health insurance plan. But for the first $10,000, uh, whether the government does this or whether it's through person's work, uh, have pre-funded HSAs. 
<clears throat> mandate that people would have to get a physical once a year. That's mandatory because patients are responsible for fixing health care too. They just can't go to the doctor's office and drop off their problems and say, you fix it and you know what, if you tell me to do something and I'm diabetic and I continue to eat the way I eat or if I have emphysema and I keep smoking, there have to be ramifications for that if we're all in it together and I think we do need to be all in it for together. But if the first monies that came out of the person's pocket, non-catastrophic care for drugs, for MRIs, for those things were out of people's pockets with no payer involved, I think you'd see prices coming down really quick. I really do. Be, and I don't think hospitals would go out of business. I think they'd have to reorganize. If they started saying, you know what, we're going to start buying more urgent care centers, which by the way they're doing now. Lots of health systems are making investments in urgent care centers now. Even Optum is making investments in urgent care centers, apart from their other businesses they do, which is health, health coverage as well. Um, Getting consumers to pay that money makes a big difference. When you take the payers out, and now you've got to convince a consumer that our MRI center is better than your MRI, the other one, and we'll be a few dollars cheaper, and we can be better quality too, you know, or we're the same price and better quality. You're giving people the reason to take out their wallet and say, okay, you know, I'm paying you with my pre-funded HSA. I like that idea. I don't think there's any major solution that's going to work for everybody, by the way. I don't. I think we have to be ready for that. I think a big part of what's the problem with Obamacare, and I don't want to go on too long, with Obamacare and this, this change in the Republicans have now, it's like keeping everything the same and you're just moving monies. Nothing is really changing in the structure and it's really the structure that's gotten us here. So I think somebody has to be willing to take a big swallow and to say, we got to make change. Um, but I appreciate the question, and I'm in line with you about the consumerism for sure. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.